Today, I wanna to help open up your mind and show you the significant role that our jaw and our bite have on our posture and even our movement. When people think about the idea of posture, they're usually thinking about the position of the spine and also tight or underactive muscles. But that's just one piece of the puzzle and what could be influencing those spine curves and tight or underactive muscles in the first place could be the position of your jaw and your bite. We have sensory receptors all over our bodies that help us understand where we are in space, what is touching what, what is moving in relationship to what, and how we need to better organize our body or our posture in order to effectively do what we need to do. One example of this within our skin would be Ruffini corpuscles, which are important for sensing stretches and micro stretches, which help us understand how our joints and muscles are moving in relationship to other things and where they could be in space. In our teeth themselves, we have something called periodontal ligaments. And these go within our gums, and these are very important and have been shown for helping us understand where our body is in space in relationship to our cranium and our jaw and our bite. If you've ever seen this creepy guy before, he's called the homunculus. And this guy represents visually our somatosensory cortex, which is reflective of our motor functions and also our sensory abilities and what areas of our body are most heavily used for that. 45% of our somatosensory cortex is made up of our teeth, our jaw, our lips, and our cheeks. And that's a pretty significant influence on our motor and sensory function. Our molars in particular, our back teeth, are very helpful for us feeling and sensing our heels and our ability to sense the ground underneath our heels. There was a systematic review released earlier this year that looked at a lot of different studies that looked into the jaw and the bite and its relationship to posture and movement. And what they found is that the majority of these studies did find somewhat of a meaningful connection there. And as for why some didn't, I want to discuss later, but I just want to review a couple of studies in particular to help you see kind of what's going on here. This study showed that when they introduced malocclusion or a poor bite pattern onto those that did not have that before, they had significant changes in the pressure within their feet once they introduced those malocclusions. This study looked into scoliosis and showed that those with scoliosis had twice as high a likelihood of presenting with some sort of temporal mandibular disorder function and also poor occlusion. And this study suggests those with TMJ disorders tend to have a higher prevalence of postural abnormalities. This study found a correlation between crossbite and asymmetric positions of the spine, meaning those that had more lateral flexion or side bending of their spine. And this stuff doesn't just affect our posture, it also very likely affects our movement as well. They found that those with more significant malocclusions, and this is what I really want you to remember, spent less time on the ground in their gait. And when they measured the right side of their body, they spent less time in particular in stance phase on on that right side. Those with less significant malocclusions or no malocclusions had more stable gait and they spent more time on the ground. Now, when we improve the position of the jaw and bite, there are studies that show improved, for example, running symmetry. This study looked at different types of runners and their individual patterns before using a splint and after using a splint that was made individually for them to help improve their occlusion and also the position of their jaw. And they found that it actually resulted in increased running symmetry. Our body's posture and movement is heavily dependent on our relationship with the ground and the ability for us to sense the ground underneath us. And we understand that the jaw likely has an influence on our ability to sense the ground and be able to control our center of mass as it relates to the ground. When we shift onto one side of our body when we're walking through the world, let's say we're going right and we're going into our right stance phase of gait. We understand that we need the ground to be underneath our right foot to feel stable there, but we also have an increased ability to bite down and feel our back molars on the right side. Remember the role of the molars and the teeth and our ability to sense the ground. We have this because the maxilla right here is going to rotate slightly to the right side. And we have the mandible right here rotating slightly to the left side. So you have this sort of interplay like this, and that allows for increased bite sense on the right side. And if you were stuck in a pattern where you were lateralized to the right side, let's say you were in what we would call a right lateral pelvic tilt, usually what you see is a mandible or a jaw that is going to the left relative to a maxilla that's going to the right. 
and this is representing what this whole body posture is showing us. If you want to see the influence this can have on you, just gently bite down and see which side of your molars in the back contact more easily. For many people, that's going to be on the right relative to the left. And then go ahead and take your shoulder internal and external rotation measurement. Just lay on your back with your elbow out by your side like this and just let your arm drop until you feel like your shoulder is going to roll forward. And then go back and then stop once you feel like you have to push through resistance. And then take a popsicle stick and place it in the back teeth and very gently bite down on the side that you have less occlusion on. And just hold that and then retest your measurement after that and notice a difference. Then go and then bite down on that popsicle stick gently on the back teeth where you touch more. And when you do that, your measurements get worse in many cases. And what that represents is that our teeth grounding on one side improves our awareness and our sense of stability and even safety neurologically on that side. And that unlocks tension on that side. This is a very repeatable and consistent thing. You can do this with anyone and you get very similar results. Now, if you have significant jaw influences on your posture, this is not something you can just fix by yourself. But there are exercises that are complementary to different interventions that allow us to get into a position of neutrality. Let's say I had a jaw that was deviated to the left because I was shifted over to the right side of my body. I'm in that right lateral pelvic tilt. What I could do is get myself in a position where my spine curves are relatively neutral, and then I gently push my jaw over to the right. And this oftentimes frees up the neck and a lot of those shoulder things we talked about earlier because you are creating an opportunity for a better bite and better occlusion and better ground sense on the side that's missing it. We're starting in the safest, most relaxed position you can do this in. And it's the best for beginners, but you could do this in a seated position or even standing if you really wanted to, but generally the more relaxed you are, the better. So we have our feet supported in a 90-90 right here, and we have a little towel roll underneath the neck, and it's just thick enough so that it's supporting us. And it shouldn't feel like it's so thick to where it's jamming our chin back, or it's too small where our chin falls forward. It should be just naturally supporting us. Now, there's a couple of different ways we can do this, but regardless, we're going to be pushing into our chin in some way, and we're going to be pushing our chin back against the resistance of our fingers for about a two out of 10 intensity. So it's an isometric contraction. And we're gonna hold these things for about five to 10 seconds. Now, the first one we're gonna do is place two fingers on the side of the chin. We'll do the right side, for example, right here. It shouldn't be too far back on the jaw right here, just on the side of the right chin there. And all we're gonna do is just two out of 10, push our jaw to the left. But we're gonna fight that and we're gonna resist that and we're gonna keep our chin going to the right. But ultimately what's gonna happen is it's not really going to move. The chin's gonna stay in the same place because it is that isometric contraction. And we're gonna hold that for about five to 10 seconds. The other thing that we can do is we can press our chin back with two fingers like this. So we're gonna to try to retrude our jaw, but we're going to push against that two out of 10 to start. And we're gonna to try to push our jaw forward, isometric contraction. We're gonna start most people with about one to two minutes of total time, taking about a five to 10 second break in between each five to 10 second rep. And as I mentioned, two out of 10 to start, but you wanna add one out of 10 intensity every couple of days. So for example, start at two for the next couple of days, then go to a three for the next couple of days, then go to a four, to a five, but you don't want to ever really go past a five. You wanna stay at a five for a couple of weeks or as long as you need to. But what about the studies that didn't show a correlation? Well, it's important to discuss those as well to be fair to what the research shows. Now, some of the splint studies did show really positive results and others didn't. And the reason why I think the ones that didn't get results had the outcomes that they did was because of the way that the splints were being made. Now, you can build it up on one side more than the other, so that way you can create more even contact of your teeth but again it depends on how it's being made when people create these splints a lot of the times they're not taking into account the position of the cranium and also the cervical spine and the rest of the body posture now to be transparent in a lot of these studies they did not describe the position the body was in when they took the impressions to make these splint devices 
And that might be a big hint right there. In order for us to be able to properly create some sort of appliance that improves the position of the jaw and the bite, we have to take everything into account. And I think a lot of people aren't doing that. Alice Lamb is a dentist and she is part of an organization called Applied Integration Academy, who are the first people that are truly taking into account the entire body when they make things like splints. Alice has explained to me that when she makes appliances for the bite or the mandible or the cranium, she really makes sure that she puts the person in a neutral position, meaning that they have their heels grounded on the floor. They have a neutral position of their lumbar, thoracic, and cervical spines. And also their cranium is, is in a position that will allow them to express neutrality as well. And then she takes the impressions there. If we can all agree that it's pretty likely our posture is being influenced by our jaw and our bite, then doesn't it make sense that the rest of our body and that posture is influencing what's going on up here as well? It's a two-way street. I see all the time when we create more neutrality within the bigger structures below the head and the neck, a lot of the times occlusion changes. People's bite noticeably changes and the position of their head changes. So wouldn't it make sense if we're trying to determine what kind of an appliance and how to make that appliance for a person who needs that, they should be able to access a more neutral position of their body first or just simply put them in a position to then get everything in alignment so that way that they can make that appliance that will help hold them in that alignment. This might sound crazy, but as this industry progresses, I strongly believe that the best trainers and the best coaches are going to have relationships with orthodontists, with dentists, with physical therapists, and all these other disciplines that can come together and help understand how can we get someone in a position that restores movement and more neutrality to the body. So that way the body can access all these different positions it couldn't before because the body is being held in a pattern. It's being held in something that is limiting oftentimes its ability to either shift over to one side or simply shift into either side. And if this is being significantly influenced by the position of a jaw or malocclusion, then we need to be able to refer out effectively and have a dialogue with how we as movement specialists can get the body in a good position, but work alongside dentists who can create proper appliances to allow for repositioning of the things above the level of the neck. If you want more information, I'm going to link the studies down below in the description. And again, stay tuned for more content that's coming out very soon of how we can align these things better and pick exercises for those who it is appropriate for that will help take into account things from head to toe, from the head to the rib cage and thorax, all the way down to the pelvis and the feet and effectively integrate these. So we have a better ability to sense the ground as we shift from side to side, because that's the name of the game. Can we effectively control our center of mass? Can we get everything aligned to help control our center of mass more effectively? And for some people, they need specific dental appliances that will allow them to do that. I will link more resources for that as well.